Today on No Greater Love with Pastor Jeff Kramer. Now, when it comes to federal headship here, I, I, would, I would make the um, illustration this way. That when we vote, especially on a national election, what do we do? We vote for a representative, okay? And that representative gets sent to Washington, D.C., okay? So on the national election side. And now, when that, that representative goes to Washington, D.C., what happens there? They make decisions. They make decisions perhaps that some of us like and perhaps that some of us hate. But regardless of whatever takes place, is whether we, whether we agree or we disagree with them, they are there making decisions. And those consequences of those decisions, right or wrong, they spill out and they fall down to the rest of the country. Is that understandable? Okay, so you get the concept now of federal headship. You're in a Welcome to No Greater Love with Pastor Jeff Kramer. It's been said before that we're not sinners because we have sinned, but we're sinners because we were born that way, and therefore we sin. Today we're continuing our study through the book of Romans and pick up at the end of chapter 5. Paul's teaching us about federal headship, which is a theological term that can be confusing. The essence is that Adam represents all of humanity, and his decision to sin affects the rest of us accordingly. In short, the consequences of sin are passed from generation to generation, which results in both spiritual and physical death. Why does this matter to you and I? Because Jesus came to take away the sting of sin and death. Let's join Pastor Jeff as he teaches through a message titled, Understanding My Choice. So uh, maybe I'll read the, the first verse, verse number 12. Paul says, therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all sinned. And Father, I pray that as we study your scripture now, that you would send your Holy Spirit to open the eyes of our understanding. Uh, we know that unless you give us understanding, the things in which we uh, look at within your word, to the natural man, they're foolishness. But to the spiritual man, to the man that has been given new life, that the words that you have spoken are indeed life. And, 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 and we ask that you would work within us. And so we commit our time to you by faith in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, um, understanding my choice. You know, this, this topic that we get into here in verses 12 down through 21 of this chapter, uh, this is the topic known as federal headship. And that is a, uh, you know, that's a, it's a super theological term there, if you will. But I want to make sure that I, make, that I take this theological term and I move it into something that we understand, okay? Because when I drop the word federal headship out there, I would, I would speculate that most of you go, what are we talking about here, federal headship? You know, and, and we, you get that kind of that blank stare. And I know I've got Bible students in here, so maybe some of you Bible students are able to, to capture this to a greater degree. But God has placed this within his scripture in the understanding of what we're going to see here between Adam and between Jesus and understanding that federal headship, the representation, if you will, that has gone on. This is something that Paul wrote to those that were in Rome, to, those that, to that place to where he was taking Christ, to where he wanted to get it to the core of the city so that it would spread everywhere, the good news. And understanding justification, as we've seen over the past several weeks, maybe month or so, that, that, that understanding this changes our heart towards God because we see how good God has been towards us. It, it, it's no longer filled with these fluffy words uh, that have no meaning behind it. We've seen the tangible meaning behind this. And so with federal headship, again, what is it? It's nothing more than a theory that the theologians put in place to help us with this thing of understanding, to, to, to help us to understand how Adam sinned when Adam sinned and it spread to all mankind. You know, the, it, it's important that we capture this. So maybe I could illustrate it. Um, and I'm gonna call for your participation in this, okay? Uh, partly because I wanna see if you're alive and you're with me. <laughs> And if we need to make the coffee stronger next week, and, and partly so that I can know that you're, you're, you're paying attention and understanding this, okay? So by a show of hands right now, okay? And, and, and uh, I'm not going to call anybody out, okay? So be relieved about that. But by a show of hands, who here has ever voted in an election? Raise your hand up. Okay, 
Very well. That is virtually most of the room that has voted in an election. You can put your hands down now. See, that wasn't too bad. You know, you're being conditioned to respond, you know, to engage. And so, praise the Lord. That's awesome. Now, when it comes to federal headship here, I, I, would, I would make the um, illustration this way. That when we vote, especially on a national election, what do we do? We vote for a representative, okay? And that representative gets sent to Washington, D.C., Okay, so on the national election side. And now when that, that representative goes to Washington, D.C., what happens there? They make decisions. They make decisions perhaps that some of us like and perhaps that some of us hate. But regardless of whatever takes place, is whether, we, whether we agree or we disagree with them, they are there making decisions. And those consequences of those decisions, right or wrong, they spill out and they fall down to the rest of the country. Is that understandable? Okay, so you get the concept now of federal headship. Why? Well, because as, as it comes to Adam, Adam was the first representative of the human race. He's the first guy that God created, okay? And, and, and whether he got it all right or he got it all wrong, and, and he surely messed this one up right here, you know, now that just shows you you got to be a selective fruit eater, you know, be very careful. But his decision to sin against God, it has filtered down to the rest of mankind, to the entire world. That is the concept of federal headship. It's not, it, it, it's, 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 a, it's a theory, a simple theory that we can grasp even though it is a theological term that the theologians use to describe Adam, his first sin, the original sin, and how it has spilled down to everybody else. So, so I, I hope you, you can capture that. Now, these verses that we're gonna look at here, verses 13 down through about 17 or so, um, you know, what goes on here? There's a contrast between our natural head, which is Adam, and our spiritual head, which is Christ. If you're in Jesus Christ, if, 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 if you have asked the Lord for forgiveness, if you surrendered your heart to him, you must understand that, that Christ is the spiritual head and that he has given you new life. That impacts both the here and the now, and it impacts what takes place in eternity. And so we come to our very first point of this morning, and that is origin and result of sin the origin and the result of sin. Verse 12, one more time. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. Hmm. The origin of sin. Well, how did sin get into the universe? How did sin get into the world? Well, let's talk about these for just a second. We know that, 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 that Jesus spoke in the Gospel of Luke, Luke 10, verse number 18, that Jesus said that he saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. We know that as we survey the scriptures, in fact, I'll read this to you. You can follow me there if you'd like. Uh, book of Isaiah, chapter 14. It is just beyond the middle, middle point of your Bible. But in Isaiah 14, uh, all the way down at verse number 12, that Isaiah pins this. He gives us a glimpse behind the scenes. He says, how you were fallen from heaven, O Lucifer. Okay, that is Satan. That is devil. There's, uh, you know, this is the, the, the terminology or the technical name that Satan first had. It was Lucifer. It was day star is, I guess, what it stands for. He says, son of the morning. He says, how you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations, for you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest side of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest depths of the pit. And here's the picture. Here's all of this. Again, in, in the Gospel of Luke, that Jesus said that he saw Satan fall like lightning. Isaiah gives us this picture here of these five I will statements of pride that, 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 that Lucifer, that Satan, that the devil, that, that, that he put forth. And this pride of him peddling this particular agenda, the agenda was I will, I will, I will. That agenda, trying to gain support to that, this led to him getting boosted out of heaven. Now, in Ezekiel, which is two books to your right, in Ezekiel 28, you can follow if you'd like, otherwise just sit quietly as I, as I share this with you. But in, in Ezekiel 28, we get a little bit farther, uh, you know, a, a greater picture here, okay? Because God speaks to something that's going on behind the scenes, behind the king of Tyre. He speaks to the spiritual side of what was taking place, okay? And he says this, Ezekiel 28, verse 14, 
He says, you were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created until iniquity was found in you. By the abundance of your trading, here's that word trading, okay? This word trading in the Hebrew literally means peddling. What was he peddling? He was peddling what we just looked at in Isaiah 14, these I wills, this, this aspect of pride. I'm going to do this. I'm going to be above God. I'm going there. And, and he convinced uh, you know, a third of the angels of heaven to follow him in this. The same way that the enemy loves to come in and he loves to peddle a different uh, you know, uh, ideas and different agendas here so that he would divert us away from following Christ even right now. And so it goes on, and in, 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 in what's the magnification that I'm trying to bring out to you? Nothing more than this, is, is that when we understand the origins of sin, sin entered the universe through what Satan did. Satan, pride was found within his heart, and he revolted against the Most High. So that's how it entered the universe. Second thing regarding that, how did sin enter the world? Well, we know that sin entered the world through Adam. You know, this goes all the way back to the very first book in your Bible, Genesis chapter 2, verse number 16. We see that God gives a, a command at that particular point. He gives some instructions and some directions uh, to Adam as to what Adam is not to do. He was given great freedom and great choice for a number of things, but he says, God says, hey, not this one. You are not to touch this one. And so ultimately, we get to Genesis chapter 3, verses 6 to 8, and we see the fall of man. We see the selection that was made. We see that Adam ends up blowing it, um, and, and both him and Eve, his wife, you know, they ended up sinning. So as it pertains to the origins of sin, let us understand that under the doctrine of federal headship, under the doctrine of, of you know, uh, Adam being the representative, the first man and the representative of mankind, he failed. He fell after falling prey to the temptations that Satan put before him. And the only way that, that you and I or Adam could have, could have stood him is, is by remembering what God has said. And it's the same thing for you and I, is that when we come to Christmas time and we come to hear about, oh, it's baby Jesus and, and man, he's, you, know, it's, it's, uh, you know, the worshiping of Christ is so surrounded by so many other things within our culture. Why this is a particular day, you know, um, uh, December 25th is a particular day that, that Christians have taken and used in turn, you know, to, to, to celebrate Christ, to celebrate, you know, real purpose and real meaning. It just doesn't happen on Christmas. It happens all the time. But, but Satan is working behind the scenes. The enemy of your soul, the devil, the accuser, he's always looking to draw us off course and to get us into an area of being preoccupied with stuff, with things, with busyness. Someone has once said this, that, that, that crazy acronym, busy, right? Burdened under Satan's yoke. And that's what he loves to do. And I, and I, and I tell you that even at Christmas time, when, when, when there is um, more of a, of a culturally accepted celebration of the Christ child, uh, for some, for many, yet there still is that distraction of busyness that is there. And we go through and we completely miss the focus. I, I, I want you to understand and I want you to realize that in the process or, or in the doctrine of justification, in, in recognizing the work that God has done for us, it is a work that we can know him through. It is a work that we should have understanding in and it is a work that we should often remember so that we don't get sucker punched by Satan, so that these things don't get diluted within our life because Christmas is not the only time that we celebrate the, the Christ child. We celebrate him all year long. We celebrate him daily within our lives. But when that, that daily celebration becomes diluted, then we find ourselves busy, burdened under Satan's yoke. And we go about the temporal affairs and we completely miss the eternal affairs. We're going to have temporal affairs. That's okay. It's not a problem. It's not, you know, we are to be diligent. We're not to be lazy. The, you know, Proverbs tells us about these things. But when the temporal affairs move to the place to where they supersede any aspect of care for our soul, then we run into a problem and we begin to fall into deeper and deeper pits and the struggle happens. And then we ask the question, well, why can't I get up in my life? Why am I always frustrated? Why is everything I try to do, it seems like I'm hitting a brick wall and all these things? Because you're fighting against the enemy of your soul. And he wants to trap you. And God says, man, I want, I want you not to fight against me. I want to deliver you. So the origin of sin came into the universe through Satan, came into the world through Adam. And if I could make this statement, 
I think it's important for us to understand that there is a difference between the root of sin, which comes from the, under the federal headship, which comes under that representation of Adam, the root of sin, and the fruit of sin. The fruit of sin is the things that you and I do individually, the, 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 the things that, that, that we blow it in, in our daily, in our regular lives. This could be attitude, this could be actions, this could be anything that presents itself in contrast or in opposition to God. So it covers a number of things. It's not only the external thing. Well, externally, I just did that. I, you know, I kicked the guy in the knee or something. I don't know. Oh, you sinner. Yes, that's true. But, but when you contemplated murder within your heart, that was the greater sin. You just didn't have the opportunity to execute that. Silly analogy, but I think you can capture that. Well, uh, remember what David wrote. Psalm 51, verse 5, that David said this, He said, behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. What is David saying? He's saying, listen, I was born with the root of sin in me. That's it. So I want you to look to your neighbors right now and say, you were born with sin. (laughs) Yeah, you may not agree with that. That's not my problem. That's your problem. Yell at Adam. I don't know. Uh, but the reality of it is, is that we're born with sin. Now, let me give you an awesome illustration, and I don't think my younger kids are in here, so I got a little liberty for a minute. They might be watching on TV, though, so I got to be careful. Okay, you got, uh, many of you know that I'm a, I'm a uh, Jody and I, we are our fresh grandparents, time num- time's number four right now, so uh, our youngest one, uh, our youngest grandbaby, he is three, three and a half months years old. Last night, I had all the kids over to the house, and we all sat down, and the table, and we were having uh, dinner and everything, and just, just talking and everything. And boy, from a three and a half month year old child, you can already see sin starting to surface in this little guy's life. <laughs> <laughs> and so we had that discussion last night as a family. And I didn't start the discussion, but uh, uh, my point is, is that from the earliest of age, it's there. Sin is there. We're born with sin because of what Adam did. Now, First uh, John... Um, He says this, 1 John 1, 8, uh, the Apostle John, he writes, he says that if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Again, what is he talking about? He's talking about the root of sin, okay? It's not a struggle in the sense that he's, he's trying to pen somebody down to a particular sin. Well, that's your act of sin. That's not what he's saying. Under the federal headship, Adam was the first man that was created. He represented all of mankind. His sin, because he sinned, it invariably has transferred down to the rest of mankind. The apostle John in 1 John 1, 9, he says, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not within us. And so, so the big picture of it is this, is scripturally, there is no argument about our condition before God. The matter is settled. Now, this moves on to the result of sin. Now, this gets a little bit more uh, intense, but it's super easy to, to see, okay? And, and I need your participation on this one, okay? So if you haven't followed me on any of the other scriptures, I need you to follow me on this one. Go to the beginning of your Bible, very first book of your Bible, chapter five, Genesis chapter five. Now, here in Genesis chapter five, what do we find? Well, we find the result of sin. We see um, uh, we see a magnification of this picture of what sin brings forth, okay? This whole chapter is spilling that out, all 32 verses. I'll give you the first and second verse, and then I'll, I'll, um, I'll describe it to you. It says this, Genesis 5 and 1, it says, this is the book of the genealogy of Adam. So who are we talking about in this? Adam. Adam. It says, in the day that God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. He created them male and female, and he blessed them, and he called them mankind in the day they were created. Now, it tells us in verse number three, it gives us this first segment of Adam's life, how long he lived before he had a son. And then the remainder of this, it begins to show all the other uh, people that came up behind Adam. And I want you to notice one common phrase. It begins at the very end of verse number five. The last three words of verse number five, it says... And he died. Good morning, Grace FM family. Springtime is upon us, and it's so great to see the fresh life all around. The Bible talks about how Jesus lived a sinless life, but then was crucified, hung on a cross, and buried at the tomb for three days. 
In remembrance of this, we celebrate Good Friday on March 29th at 12 noon. But on the third day, Jesus overcame sin and death and is alive again. We're celebrating his resurrection on March 31st with services at 8 and 10 a.m. We'll have a full children's ministry, passionate worship, and a gospel-centered message from Pastor Jeff. You're invited. Make sure to bring your family or a friend to Resurrection Weekend at Westminster Calvary. For more information, including location and regular service times, text CHURCH to 720-354-6485. Again, that's CHURCH to 720-354-6485. See you there. The results of sin, as you find it, starting with Adam and continuing down through the generations that followed Adam, Adam, his lineage. Verse number five, what, what, what happened in that time? Well, this is Adam. He died. Dude lived a long time, 930 years. I wonder if he had wrinkles. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> then, then you find it goes down to, to Seth and Enosh and, and, and all of this. And, and what do you see at the end of verse number eight? And he died. And then you get to the end of verse number 11, and he died. And the end of verse number 14, and he died. Verse number 17, and he died. And the pattern repeats all the way down through, through verse number 32. So the result of sin, this is what happens. The result of sin is that it leads to death. And this particular genealogy, it shows us the repeating pattern and the thematic theme of the destruction of sin. And, and, and you and I, when we look around our world and we see all the things that are going on and, and we recognize not only our own mortality of approaching death, but of all the destructive things that have gone on around us and that continue to go on around us, every bit of it is a result of sin. Easy to grasp, at least in a theological context, sitting in service in the sanctuary here on a Sunday morning. But sometimes I think we forget that when we're out in the, on the highways and the byways doing our own life, going about our own business. We suddenly think that the battle is against flesh and blood. It's not against flesh and blood. The scripture tells us that emphatically, but I think oftentimes we forget that. Uh, someone has once said it this way. Um, they, they said that, uh, for everybody following Adam, uh, that, that man is not a sinner because he's sin, that he's a sinner because he's born that way and therefore sins. That's an accurate depicture. Depicture? <laughs> I don't know. You take a picture and then take it away. You delete it. It's a deleted picture is what I would say. That's an accurate depiction or an accurate picture. Well, this takes us to the second point. And the second point is, which present do you want? Because in verses 13 to 17, back in the book of Romans now, uh, Paul, as he continues on here, he goes and he does something kind of cool, okay? I'm going to get fancy for just a second, but I'll define the fanciness. It's fancy in my own mind, so I don't know. Maybe I'm humoring myself. <clears throat> so in verses 13 down through 17, uh, and perhaps in your Bible you see that it's offset with parentheses or maybe there's a dash or something like that in there. But, but, but what Paul does here in these things is he puts what is called a parenthetical statement in place that is nothing more than an, uh, an explanation of amplification that he put in place here. And he's amplifying here, verses 14 down through 17, what he already said in verse number 12. So he's just unraveling it. He's taking it to a deeper understanding. He's giving more insight onto this, okay? Verse 13 and 14, I'll read it now. He says, for until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who was a type of him who was to come. Okay, these, two, these first two verses here, from Adam to Moses. Adam is the beginning of mankind, and what does Moses most often represent within the scripture? He represents the law, okay? So what he had shared, or what he is sharing here, is, is that regardless of whether a law was there or not, that sin began with Adam, and it reigned. That's all for today. Join us for our next broadcast of No Greater Love with Pastor Jeff Kramer, weekdays at 10.30 a.m. No Greater Love is an outreach ministry of Westminster Calvary and is supported by listeners like you. If you would like to partner with us, please text any dollar amount to 84321. We would like to personally invite you to join us for our weekly worship services Sundays at 8 or 10 a.m. and Wednesdays at 6.30 p.m. We are located in Westminster, Colorado on the northeast corner of Church Ranch and Wadsworth Parkway, 
near the Vasa Fitness. If you're not local, tune into the weekly live stream on our web campus, app, Roku, or on Apple TV. Have you downloaded the free Westminster Calvary app yet? You can stay up to date on coming events, join a small group, request prayer, and watch live worship services. Just search Westminster Calvary on your favorite app store today. Lastly, we're a church that's ready to serve you. If we can do so, give us a call at 303-223-4640. And remember, there's no greater love than when Jesus gave up his life for you and me. Thanks and God bless.